Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Principal Solutions Architect, Bill Shin. Hi. Hello. So you came back, uh, I think, or you didn't see the last session and you came from the other one and um, hopefully you, you, there's some repeat attendees. So uh, this, this talk is about encryption and key management. It's a, a much more detailed talk um, to provide you a really good overview of kind of an encryption primer as well as uh, the features and services you can use within AWS to encrypt your data. Uh, we take encryption very seriously. Obviously, it's sensitive data. There's uh, legal requirements in some cases, contractual requirements, uh, sometimes data privacy laws that require encryption. So we've innovated very, very heavily around the crypto space uh, in the last probably two, uh, two plus years to provide a spectrum of options to customers who want to encrypt their data. So depending on where you are in the journey to the cloud, you, you may have certain requirements, whether that's just a comfort level or an actual requirement to manage the keys yourself. And so you can do that, and, and you can not give us anything but encrypted data, or, and you can do all the encryption outside of AWS and put that data in the cloud. Or we'll talk about features you can use to encrypt the data basically with a checkbox, uh, using features that are built into the platform. So we'll put this in three sections. We'll start with client-side encryption and how you can encrypt your data and manage your own keys. We'll talk about server-side encryption where we encrypt that data for you and we manage the keys for you. And we'll talk about key management where you can do it on your own. You can use AWS key management service. You can use partner solutions or you can use Cloud HSM, which is a hardware security module built for the cloud or provisioned to the cloud. Here's the key questions to answer or to consider. So as you're planning a strategy for encryption in AWS, um, there's really three, three questions to consider. Where are the keys stored? On a system in your data center or in AWS? What are the durability and availability implications of where your keys are stored? Where are the keys used? Is it happening in code you control? Is it happening on behalf in code or host that AWS controls? And who has direct access to the keys? Who has the authorization to use the keys, even if they don't have direct access to the keys? So we'll start with a little encryption primer because this makes up kind of the fundamental building blocks of how we approach encryption in AWS. Um, with the scale that we operate, you know, there are, there are multi-trillion objects, uh, I believe two, over two perhaps trillion objects in, in um, in S3, I think, and uh, there, many of those are using server-side encryption. So when you start thinking about the scale of the number of keys that are actually provisioned, um, it becomes a, a pretty staggering number. Um, given that we have you know, over a, a million active customers, uh, the, the number of customers using EBS encryption has, has gone up dramatically since last March, uh, and, and you know, that's, that's been using key management systems. So the number of keys, um, we have to take an envelope encryption or key hierarchy approach to how we do crypto. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So you generally have hardware or software generating a symmetric data key. So uh, that's a, a key where you know, the, it's just one key. There's not a public and private key pair. You take that symmetric key and you encrypt your plain text data with that key and you get encrypted data. Then you take that encrypted data and you put it in storage and it's encrypted at rest. So what do you do with the, data symmetric, the symmetric data key? Well. You have a master key, and this, is, this builds a hierarchy. So you take that key, and how do you secure it? Well, one thing you can do is, is encrypt it with a master key that's stored somewhere else. So you send your data encryption key to a service or something that has the master key, encrypts that data encryption key that encrypted your object with the master key. And you can have separate authorizations on who can use the master key to decrypt the symmetric data key. And now you have an encrypted data key, and you can store that encrypted data key with the encrypted object which means that even though the object is there and it's in ciphertext and you have the key that's next to it, which seems like, why would I store my key with my data? But that key is encrypted to a key that's elsewhere with different authorization in a different place. So it allows you to keep the encryption key encrypted to another key with your encrypted ciphertext. So what do you do with the master key? How do you protect that? Well, you have a red key. And maybe you encrypt that with a, with a blue key. And how do you encrypt the blue key? Well, use an orange key. 
How do you encrypt the orange key? Well, maybe a green key or a blue key, right? So it's just a key hierarchy. And so in some cases you do this, you know, maybe per, per row or per column or per item in a database or a, or a NoSQL database. And then you maybe have the encryption keys that are per row or per item or per column or user um, encrypted to, and you store that with the encrypted data, but you, you encrypt that to an application key, which might have a server key, which might have a region key or an availability zone key. And you can store all those in KMS or you can store them in your software, but basically it's about reducing the blast radius of the loss of a single key. So if someone gets a plain text copy of one of your encryption keys for a user or a row or an item, that's a very small impact, it's one record. And as you move up the, the hierarchy, you know, the blast radius uh, increases. But also you allow for different access models. So you can say I only want, you know, certain people to access a subset of the data and, and only other certain people or under certain conditions can access all the data. And you can, again, it's important too because when you're using those keys and taking key operation or crypto operations against those keys, you have another opportunity to audit and to get visibility into who's using those keys. So basically when you want to get back to the data, you've got to unwrap it, right? You have to take the, you take the data, you figure out what key was associated with the encrypted data, you find the key that was in, used to encrypt the data key and you send it to that service. And you can create all kinds of architectures this way that, that limit and partition data um, using things like, like a, a crypto proxy or a proxy architecture where you know, some services can decrypt sensitive data, other ones have to go through a proxy to do that where you have an additional enforcement point, an additional audit point. So we'll move into, into client side encryption. Uh, basically this is where you encrypt your data and you send it to AWS. Uh, so let's talk about, um, you know, the, the way you would do this. So your applications in your data center and your applications in EC2. You can encrypt that data uh, wherever you want, either in your application on EC2 or, or encrypt it entirely in your data center and store that on S3, and lots of customers do that. They use, they use S3 as, as a dumb data store, where we don't, you know, they never send us anything, you know, that's in plain text, they just use it as a backup, and that's a fine model. Um, then you can roll that into Glacier using lifecycle policies to get uh, um, a, a life cycle around your data to get a lot of durability and resiliency of, and the benefits of S3, the low cost storage, global scale, but you're not ever sending sensitive data to us, it's encrypted to keys you completely manage on premises. Uh, you can store it on EBS, so if you attach EBS volumes to an instance and you encrypt your data entirely in your application or even outside of AWS, and you can still store it on EBS to be accessed by applications, and when needed, those applications can then access keys stored elsewhere, right? Or, or you're doing it in applications on EC2. So this is where you manage the keys client side, but that doesn't necessarily mean outside of AWS. The client might be on an EC2 instance running an application where you completely control the keys, and maybe even the software architecture for key management also runs in EC2. Right, and you still completely control that. We don't, it's just bits and packets. We wouldn't see whether you're, you know, hosting cat pictures or hosting a key management infrastructure. It's still gonna be uh, encrypted with your client side keys, your uh, algorithms, your key links and, and cipher suites and whatever you want it to do in your application. Uh, Redshift and RDS, um, the use cases there would be you encrypt your data outside those services. In this case, with client side encryption, you might do it at a field level inside an application. So, um, you know, sensitive personal information, identifiable information, um, you might store that in, in Redshift, but not, not put it in plain text and have us do it, but in, your case, in this case, do it client side. DynamoDB, um, you know, you have basically a, uh, an item that you're putting in Dynamo, and most applications when they use Dynamo, they, I mean, there's their searches and indexing, but a lot of the data that's stored in Dynamo is individual, um, you know, bits of information that are processed by an application. It's kind of the benefit of the, the NoSQL model. And so fields in those items can be, or, or individual you know, items in that, in that item can be encrypted you know, outside of, of our server-side encryption. So Client-side encryption with S3. So in order to help uh, simplify the process, we provide a solution for client-side encryption for data bound to S3. So the, the S3 encryption client is integrated into the AWS SDKs um, so that you can minimize the number of times you make, you, you, number of calls you make to encrypt data. So basically the S, when you put an object on S3, you're doing an HTTP put but if you're doing client-side encryption using our S3 client libraries, the client library will automatically generate that data key used to encrypt that object. You select the master key that you want to encrypt that data key to, whether that's in your own key management infrastructure or, and not ideally, not ideally, uh, you know, a local file with a different key in it. Anything that's, you know, from, from unsophisticated to sophisticated, you control that master key. 
but the S3 client library is the one um, that's generating the data encryption key, encrypting the object to it, and then storing both of them on S3. You can do this from your own infrastructure. You could also use the AWS SDKs for S3 to do client-side encryption using an application in EC2. Again, though, you have to keep track of which key was used to encrypt the object, right? So you get the object back, you have to have some identifier to know what the master key was. The server-side encryption is where we encrypt the data for you. Your source data comes from either systems in your data center or from an EC2 instance, again, and you can upload that data to, over, over TLS uh, to a, to a, in a secure connection to any of the, the AWS services that support uh, automatic server-side encryption. So S3, you have several options there that we'll dive into, but basically you can say, I want this object encrypted, and we'll encrypt it for you. We'll create a unique data key for that individual object. So if you're storing millions and millions of objects in S3 using server-side encryption, we're creating a unique data key for each one of those objects and encrypting that to a service key uh, that belongs to S3. Glacier's the same way, it's encrypted by default. Each um, archive or, or object you're putting in Glacier is encrypted. Oops. EBS volume encryption is, is a checkbox or a, a parameter you pass when you create an encrypted volume that you're attaching to an EC2 instance. And that uses, on the back end, key management service. Um, it, before we launched key management service uh, last year at reInvent, uh, prior to that we launched EBS encryption. And behind the scenes it was using key management service. So we would create a default key for you per region for each service. And EBS was one of those. If you checked the box that said I want this EBS volume encryption, uh, or encrypted volume, we created a service key for EBS in that, in that region and use that as the master key. So for EBS, each volume you create has a separate key. And you're allowing the service and, and EC2 to basically take that key and send it to the key, ma key management service for you for decryption. Um, but it makes it seamless and under the hood. So it's basically at rest encryption, encryption, but it's happening in kind of the storage fabric beneath the instance. You can also do that you know, up in EC2 and encrypt your EBS volumes, but this is server side encryption for EBS. Redshift does uh, you know, data at rest encryption. Um, Oracle and, and um, MS SQL have TDE support. Uh, there's also, depending on the licensing version, and there's also uh, at rest encryption for the, for, um, the RDS engines now too because they, they're using uh, underlying services to encrypt data at rest for um, the, the RDS in, in engines. So server side encryption um, is basically, you know, you're creating a, a, an object, you're, you know, you upload that and you say I want server side encryption. That can be done through the console, it can, which is unlikely, but you can do it through CLI, APIs, um, you know, for applications as well. So how does this work with AWS managed keys? Uh, the customer data is sent to the S3 web server. We generate a symmetric data key and, and use that symmetric data key to encrypt uh, the plain text. And then like we talked about before with key hierarchies, you take, we take that symmetric key, encrypt it to a master key, and you end up with an encrypted data key. And that's stored with the data in the, the S3 storage fleet. The master key is managed by AWS, the S3 service, and is protected by systems internal to AWS. So this is server-side encryption for S3. It's been around for a very long time. Now how does it work with customer-provided keys? This is a little bit of a different model. This is still not using KMS, um, or, or um, it's using server-side encryption, but you're basically handing us a key so you take your, your key and your object, and you hand it up to us and say, encrypt my, encrypt my object with my key. We basically take your key, encrypt your data, and make encrypted data with it, and store it in S3. But we throw away the key. So you, you keep track of the key, and then in order to decrypt the data, you, have to, you actually have to provide the same key when you, do, when, when you do the get. And then we decrypt the object for you and give it back to you, and authorization to do that is perform using you know, a combination of IAM and S3 bucket policies. But the, the key is, is kept on your, on your premises, but you're taking advantage of S3's you know, speed and, and, and the ability to do the encryption uh, in the cloud. But that's, that's a different model. So it's, it's, there's client side, there's customer provided keys with server side encryption, server side encryption where we do it, and then there's um, uh, additional models with KMS. So EBS server side encryption, uh, if you see the console when you're actually launching an instance, and you attach a volume to that instance, you can select to, or you create that volume, you can encrypt it. And that happens, again, under the hood, um, using KMS, and a default service key for EBS per account per region. So what about key management infrastructure? So you can see that um, you know, many, many enterprise companies have a key management infrastructure. They, they may have the talent to keep that up to date. 
they may have the talent to, to evolve and, and version that, that key management infrastructure. And it's important in some cases to keep those keys where you want them on premises. So you can use your encryption uh, in data, client applications, or you can um, run it on EC2. You can run a key management infrastructure, a vendor product in EC2, just like you would on premises using Linux and Windows instances. And then um, storing your encrypted data in the services we provided. But the key management structure can run anywhere. So we introduced uh, key management service because this is a, a, I think a lot of customers were saying key management is, is hard. It's not my core competency. If I get it wrong, I lose access to my data. Um, and we have a proven track record of encrypting data, keeping it safe, and building things for scale. So traditionally, you know, inter uh, enterprise key management systems are not built for cloud scale. Um, we had to build one ourselves. Um, it's a service that enables you to provision and use encryption keys to protect your data. Allows you to create, use, and manage encryption keys from within your own applications via the KMS SDK. Or supported AWS services like S3, EVS, RDS, Glacier, or yeah, Redshift rather. Um, and it's available in all commercial regions. At launch, it was available. So how does it work? So you have a client that authenticates between uh, the, the authorization layer. So you allow identity and access management access to a key, to, to create a key, to delete a key, uh, or to take operations on a key, for example. Um, it reaches back to a, to a crypto module that we built and run, and, and keeps keys in, in an encrypted data store. And then we vend out a data key. So you can make an API call to say, you know, create key. And then you, you would encrypt that key to a master key that never leaves that crypto module. And then you use that, that plain text symmetric key that you generated in, in, a, in a crypto module to encrypt your data. So you'd use a, 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 the client, essentially. So you would use, this is if you're using the API for KMS, right? Not using an embedded service or, or a server-side function. You're actually using this as your key management infrastructure. So you can create a bunch of different keys for different purposes and then make API calls to create keys. And when you want to decrypt those keys, so you create a key uh, we hand back a, a, a plain text copy of that key that you have in memory. You can encrypt your object with it and then throw it away. And when you want to decrypt, you make the same, you take the encrypted copy of the key that we gave back to you, send it back to KMS for decryption from the master key, and then decrypt your data. So how do these integrate with, with, with AWS services? So there, there's, again, this tiered or envelope encryption hierarchy um, where there's master keys stored in KMS, and there's different data keys for default, default data keys for each service. So if you, um, if you look in KMS and you've done anything with encryption, if you've done S3 uh, key management service or KMS encryption for on server side, you'd see an S3 key in your account for that. If you do EBS volume encryption, you'll see an EBS service key in your account, um, one for each service per region as well. So it limits the blast radius um, of compromised resources and their keys. It, it partitions access, to, you know, based on who has access to those keys by service, um, and allows it to scale, you know, horizontally effectively. So it's easy to manage a, a small number of master keys um, than, than billions of resource keys, right? The billions of resource keys get stored with the data, and then the encryption decryption operations happen against the master keys, which means you're really managing access to the master keys in most cases. So creating and managing keys in KMS is simple. It's part of the identity and access management console. You can create, uh, again, you see the, just like the inline and um, the rather the manage policies I showed in the last talk, um, these, these ones with the AWS icon on the bottom are ones that we create for you uh, per service, and you can't change those. Um, but then you can create your own customer managed keys too. So like I talked about tagging instances, you can also have different keys for different classifications of data, which means you have a hierarchy of who's authorized to access that data. So if that data is encrypted in your, in your applications, you can provision access to different keys. To, so you know, one group can take action against a critical data key, whereas other groups cannot and can only take action against, you know, say, confidential data or something, or application foo or bar. But then it also gives you that fine-grained audit trail as well. So S3 server-set encryption with KMS. We talked about server-set encryption, where we manage the keys and everything uh, on the back end, not KMS. We talked about client-side encryption with S3. And we talked about S3 encryption with customer supplied keys, but this is S3 encryption with KMS keys. So when you, when you want to do server side encryption on S3, you saw that checkbox before for the object. Now you can actually use a KMS master key and select which key you want to use. 
Same thing when you do the API operations as well. EBS is the same thing. So in, instead of just saying encrypt this volume, you now have the choice to encrypt it with a different key, which means that uh, not only do you need access to the EC2 instance to, to, or the API to be able to attach the volume, you also need access to be able to, um, you know, to, you have to have authorization to actually use the key, the master key that the volume's encrypted to. It provides a different level of isolation and boundaries within an account. RDS, very similar. So RDS encryption, you um, just pick the, the different master key that you want. is looking kind of familiar, right? Um, Redshift, so you select the master key that you want to use. The benefit of this, right, is that you've, you've now been able to integrate a shared key management infrastructure with, with new services that we've launched, which means that in, in, so you, can, you can have that pace of innovation, that as we you know, continue to innovate and invest in, in crypto and making it a core part of our products, you're able to leverage those things very, very quickly with minimal investment. So it gives you control. It gives you control of who can create a master key, who can use the master key, you know, create and export data, uh, or a data key that was encrypted by a master key. And all these things are different. Every single API operation can be individually authorized, not only against the KMS infrastructure itself, because there's, there's identity and access management policies that apply to the API actions against KMS, but like S3 buckets, um, or like resource-based permissions, for example, you, have, you can also put a policy on the key itself. So it's not just who can take operations against KMS, it's you actually have a key policy attached to that key that stays with it. Who can, you can separate access then between who can take you know, KMS administrators and perhaps different people who can use the key and the authorization stays with the key. You also are auditing the use of the master key in CloudTrail. So the integration between those two services I think is a, a, one of the, the defining parts of KMS, that every time someone sends a data key to KMS for decryption from a master key, that event is, is logged into CloudTrail. So you can alert on uh, um, you know, thresholds that are exceeded um, every time someone decrypts you know, too much data. For example, you'd be able to quickly detect bulk data decryption or inappropriate access beyond known thresholds, which is a great pattern. Um, you'd also have, from an audit perspective, who accessed my data. Um, so if you need to prove um, who accessed a certain set of data, uh, you're able to do that based on the, who's taking operations against the actual, um, against the master key. We secure your keys. So similar to how you might do this on premises, we, we never store plain text keys. Um, we, 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 plain text keys are never stored in persistent memory on runtime systems. So we never, we never take a plain text customer master key and persist it to disk. Um, they're, only, they're only managed in memory. There's separation of duties between the service teams who uh, may need access to KMS on your behalf to decrypt objects. So like uh, volume, for example, if you attach a volume an EBS volume to an EC2 instance, the EBS service has to be able to, uh, to decrypt, and the EC2 has to be able to, to attach that volume. So on your behalf, um, you know, the service itself is actually um, you know, getting access to that key. But the service teams and the operators do not access KMS um, anywhere, that, anywhere where master keys are stored or processed. And KMS operators can't access service team hosts that use the data keys. So that separation of duty exists behind the scenes in AWS. There's multi-party controls for KMS. Normal operations require signatures uh, from two or more KMS operators and any IP, on any API call. So they have uh, signing keys for the API calls when the operators are taking action against KMS for upgrades or um, replacement of, of the modules, for example. There's a very long uh, white paper, probably 50 pages, describing all of the use and operations of KMS, but a very significant section of that white paper describes the internal controls um, around how the, the crypto modules are, are provisioned and managed. I mean, there's additional detail in there if you're, if you're curious. Um, the verified claims of, of our controls on KMS are included in our SOC 1 report um, and validated and audited by a third party. Alternative key management and encryption solutions. So part of the AWS ecosystem and its benefits are that you have the marketplace. So if you already have investments in folks like, um, you know, you, all your security products you've got on-premise. This isn't specific to just key management, but the, you know, the partners like Trend Micro or AlertLogic or Sophos or others, um, you know, you can allow, Marketplace allows you to browse and, and, and buy the best security software that's available. So traditional enterprise security software is, is widely available in Marketplace. Now we have lots of partners. So you bring your own license in some cases. 
Um, and in many cases, you pay by the instance hour just like you would for EC2. So, you know, buying security when you need it and scaling down the security purchases as well is kind of a powerful part of Marketplace. Um, in Marketplace, you know, there's, there's great partners, Trend Micro, SafeNet, Metric, CypherCloud, Voltage, others um, provide encryption solutions that either integrate with our services or run an EC2. So if you have these investments on premises, which many people do, you're able to bring those to the cloud. So finally, we'll, we'll talk about um, encryption and key management with, with Cloud HSM. So this came out before key management uh, service did, and it was designed because people wanted to have close proximity between their applications running in the cloud and the hardware security modules that are needed to decrypt you know, data encryption keys. So an HSM is a tamper evident, tamper resistant hardware security module, often FIPS validated by um, you know, standards that are required for, for HSMs to be uh, certified. Um, the, the need was that you didn't want to have to go all the way back over Direct Connect or VPN, or you didn't want to have to go back over the internet to your key management infrastructure on premises, but you needed access to your data in the cloud, and you wanted that to be low latency connections, right? Or uh, the other use case was, uh, I don't want to have a data center anymore, and the last thing standing is this hardware security module that, is, that any of us didn't have, so we launched key management service, or uh, Cloud HSM, rather. It's a hardware device. Um, for crypto operations and key storage. So it, not like KMS. KMS is a key management system. It keeps track of authorizations and which keys were used to encrypt other keys, and it's a full-blown key management system. Hardware security modules are just the module. So you need a key management system in software running in EC2, uh, most likely, or you can use the APIs directly and, and kind of do that yourself. But most of these, most of the deployments have associated with them some kind of a software um, you know, solution like SafeNet or Trent. Um, strong protection of private keys, so the physical device uh, does not grant access to the keys. So if I log in, if I have access to the physical box, um, I can beat it up all day, and if I do too many operations or attempts to get at those keys, um, the, they will destroy the keys, essentially. It's a purpose-built device. Um, it's it's uh, certified by third parties to comply with security standards, and basically we provision it uh, and put it into your VPC for you. So there's a, there's a request you make. Um, we stand up uh, an HSM instance. We provision it. Um, in, into your VPC, and then the, the access to the device, so the network configuration of putting an IP on it and getting, um, getting it built up does not the same thing as access into the crypto modules. Um, so you receive a dedicated instance, uh, or dedicated access to this HSM, it's, it's an appliance just for you. It's located in AWS data centers, and it's managed and monitored by us. So for availability and for making sure it's up and running, we take care of that and we replace it if it fails, the, the, the actual hardware. And only you have access to the crypto module. So when we hand over the device, you create partitions within the HSM that we don't have access to. So if you need absolute control of the keys, but you still want to do that in the cloud, and you're not willing to use KMS, Cloud HSM is sort of that bridge on the spectrum of trust. So rather, you don't want to do it completely outside of AWS. You want to be able to have things close, but you still don't, don't or can't for some reason use KMS. So it's, it's the interim. It's today, um, this is a SafeNet Luna SA appliance, so it's, uh, it's a vendor supplied appliance, and it's just, um, that's, we may add other ones at some point, but um, today that's the, the, um, the SA appliance that we provide into your VPC. And you can use the uh, SafeNet libraries or different applications that integrate with SafeNet um, HSMs. So it's available in five regions around the world. Um, so it's kind of uh, where you are, and more regions are on the way. It's uh, provided through a CloudFormation template. So the provisioning and deployment and getting it set up is done through CloudFormation. Again, it's back to automation and repeatability and not necessarily having humans do this. Um, there's notes and, soft and, and you know, SDKs and, and all kinds of things to help you integrate your own applications with it, um, or there's software that goes with it as well. So it inclu it's included in um, our, our DSS controls as well as uh, the, the SOC compliance packages as well. So it's audited the way we provision it and deploy it is audited by third parties. Using it for database encryption, uh, so using it as a crypto provider for uh, SQL TDE, Oracle TDE, um, you can set them up to use the Cloud HSM as the crypto provider for the key that's like the database key, and then it, when the database is at rest, it, it boots up, uh, you authenticate to the Cloud HSM, it decrypts the, the database key, and then launches the database. Uh, so both of those integrate with, uh, with Oracle and SQL. And the master key is in HSM. SafeNet, 
uh, provides an ecosystem and a suite of software that goes on top of their HSM device. Uh, it provides uh, Protect V and Virtual Key Store, and Cloud HSM stores the master keys for these. So this is what you would use to um, encrypt files or, or block devices. So if you want to do um, at rest storage encryption, but you want to do that within your EC2 instance, for example, you would do that um, using a solution like this, where you're not using the underlying storage fabric from EBS, you're using something in your application like an agent. Redshift also supports using HSM as a backend for the key store. So instead of using KMS, you can actually have the, um, each, each block of data in Redshift, I think it's a one or four meg block in Redshift, is encrypted with its own block key. And that block key is encrypted to um, a, a key higher up in the hierarchy, I believe it's a cluster key, and you encrypt that key to a key that's managed in Cloud HSM. So it's again, it's that key hierarchy. You don't need any software to do that. So Redshift, um, you know, it's a, it's a cloud scale database or data warehouse and allows you to encrypt your data at rest using a key that you control. You can also build uh, custom software applications. So SafeNet provides uh, PKCS 11 or, or the Java frameworks or Microsoft, um, you know, they, they, you can use it as a crypto provider for those native APIs. Uh, there's code examples and things online and as well as from the uh, SafeNet architecture and SafeNet uh, documentation. So instead of using our SDKs with KMS that have you know, client-side encryption or API calls built into the SDK, you would use a SafeNet library. <clears throat> so by comparison, right, what's the difference? When would you use Cloud HSM versus when you'd use KMS? So Cloud HSM, you, it's dedicated to you. It's not a shared service. Um, it meets FIPS validation, whereas KMS is not there yet. Uh, you control your keys and the application software that uses them uh, completely. We don't have access to the crypto modules. Uh, we don't manage any of that for you. So there's trade-offs. You still have to manage your own can, uh, you know, key store, and you have to manage your own key management infrastructure around it as well. Uh, by comparison, KMS uh, builds on the strong foundations of an, H of an HSM foundation. So the, the crypto modules um, behind the scenes are, are built like HSMs, or hardened security appliances, we call them. Uh, highly available and durable, right? So it's, it's in every single region. It's not a single AZ service, it's a regional service, so it exists at an individual AWS region. And it allows you to easily encrypt your data across AWS services and natively integrate with those behind the scenes. So different models, and depending on the level of control you want and the visibility that you need, uh, we have options. So what are the different, the comparison um, of a difference? These are a lot of detail on the slide, but really the, 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 the trade-offs here, if you go from the left to the right of the spectrum, right? Um, on-premises HSM, where you control everything completely, tends to cost a lot more money, doesn't integrate with AWS services directly, um, but it's completely yours, right? You're the only one who has access to that device or those keys. Somewhere in the middle is Cloud HSM, so if you're willing to put it in the cloud and you want your data close to the HSM, you have access. It, you know, it's still an hourly price with a small upfront fee. Um, there's SafeNet APIs and customer code. Um, the keys are used close to your workload. And, and still, you, only, you are the only one who has access to those keys. Uh, KMS, all the way on the right, uh, you know, we manage the keys, we generate them and store them, and it's accessible through our SDKs, but it's incredibly cheap. So each master key that you create, the service default keys are free, so EBS, uh, S3, the ones that you would encrypt your data to by default, if you didn't create your own customer managed key, those come for free, but beyond that, if you create customer managed keys, Say the, the example I gave with critical and uh, confidential and uh, high class data, for example, or, or different, uh, different keys per application, for example, or per customer in some cases, if you're running a SaaS application, you might want a different customer key uh, for each of your customers. Um, those each cost a dollar per month. And then you pay only for the crypto operations against them and it's an incredibly, uh, it's a bunch of zeros behind a dot. So it's um, per you know, tens of thousands of crypto operations, like encrypting, decrypting, generating keys, you pay a fraction of a cent per operation. So more resources available. Um, you know, take a look at the key management service uh, webpage. There's a very extensive white paper, again, um, highlighting the security controls and the engineering behind KMS uh, to provide you security assurances on how the keys are, are managed, how the crypto modules are uh, on our side are, are updated and secured uh, from an organizational perspective as well as technology. Um, all the details on the partner network, S3 client encryption libraries, and then uh, the security blog too. I think between these, these two talks, 
Um, a lot of the information that we've been talking about today with regard to security will be announced on the security blog. There's a lot of very helpful articles, uh, a lot of design patterns and architecture patterns, as well as announcements, like if we add a new compliance framework um, or if we uh, you know, launch a feature or service that has a security uh, implication to it. Thank you very much.